get started so that you will have as much time to ask Dr. Nunez Smith questions. So I want to get us started today. Dr. Nunez Smith, your research and work is critical to enhance and improve health outcomes for marginalized populations. What was the defining moment for you that led you to become a health equity advocate? Yeah. Um, thanks so much for that question and for the gracious hosting. Uh, here, you know, I always talk about health equity being personal, um, as it is for, for so many, right? And I look out in this audience, I know we have shared motivation, compassion, interest drive, and urgency to get to health equity. Um, you know, it's, it's very appropriate that you talk about St. Thomas and my being from the Virgin Islands which um, is one of our nation's uh, territories. And a lot of times I ask people to name all the U.S. territories, I don't do that to <laughs> um, But uh, that are treated as a policy collective. And I don't know how many people know that, right? So in the U.S. territories, um, residents there you know, don't have the, um, the ability to vote for okay. uh, don't have um, congressional representation that can vote on the board, um, pay U.S. taxes, uh, and also there are caps in terms of the spending from Medicare uh, and Medicaid programs and other services. And why does this matter, right? It matters because there was a little girl whose father, um, in his early 40s, had his first stroke. And that left my father paralyzed as a very young man. And he had uncontrolled um, hypertension that because we were in a very limited resource setting, um, with limited providers and limited uh, access, you know, had not gotten the treatment, the prevention, the intervention, uh, that really affected all of us. Right? And that was one of just many family members, right, who I knew were dealing with um, medical issues that they shouldn't have been, quite frankly. Um, and I knew as a little girl on the floor of my grandmother's house, that I wanted to do everything I could for the community that I love so much to make sure that families could be intact and people could achieve their best health. Um, and then fast forward to when I was a medical student and anyone who's in the clinical space, I mean, it takes all of two minutes before you understand that what puts our patients in those hospital beds, you know, 10%, maybe 20% of that is biology, um, you know, has to do with genetics, the vast majority, right, 60 to 80 percent of what's driving health in our country are these social drivers, these structural drivers, and we have to intervene on those. Thank you. Um, now I'd like to open the floor to anyone who would like to ask a question at this time. Or who would like to name the other territory. <laughs> Well, we'll keep going. Uh, my next question has to do with vaccine hesitancy. Uh, it appears that that's diminished among people of color, but North Carolina residents in particular have become complacent about being updated with boosters. The North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services vaccine dashboard shows that about 50% of black North Carolinians and 56% of Hispanics have completed their initial vaccine series, but only 22% of those identifying as 18 years or older have updated and received the booster. As we see more variants of COVID-19, what is being done to encourage high-risk populations to update their boosters? Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, the reality here in North Carolina is similar to that around the, the country. I mean, I, I, I'm remiss if I don't, um, in, in an audience, always acknowledge the work I know many of you have done um, to encourage your neighbors, your family members, your communities to do everything to protect themselves um, during the pandemic. And I'm grateful for that. You know, working with the White House team, we understood very deeply that the strategy was going to be around trusted messengers. That's all of you here. Um, and tailored messaging. The reasons why people deliberate about vaccine, because um, I don't, you know, I, 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 I even try to think about our language, right? Because 
particularly when we talk about marginalized communities, if we frame it as hesitancy, right, it really puts that onus on that individual and sort of says, why, why are you not getting the vaccine? And we have to have some tough conversations, right, speak some truths uh, about why there is um, limited trust, why there's been, you know, there's been lack of trustworthiness on the part of many institutions, government, healthcare, vis-a-vis -vis marginalized populations. Um, and so why are people deliberating, right? What is, what is, um, what are people considering on their vaccination journey? And so we have to ask that question. We have to have real sincere interest right, in one another, uh, recognize and see people as individuals, right, and say, what matters to you? What questions do you have and how can we answer them? You know, as a clinician, uh, and I still see patients, I'm an internal medicine physician, when I talk to my patients about things like tobacco and smoking, I know it's going to take nine conversations on average, right? Um, as we are contemplating a really big behavioral change and decision. So we shouldn't expect anything different, right, in this situation. So we have to have that patience. We have to have that really interest in the humanity of the other and then be tailored in what we addressed and make sure that trusted messengers are the ones who are leading the way. And in the White House um, and in that COVID response, that's where we invested our resources, uh, both in terms of financial commitments, but also bringing together through something called the Community Corps uh, out of the Office of the Surgeon General, over 8,000 community leaders who would come to get the accurate information right there from the Department of Health and Human Services to take back to communities and families and neighbors. And that strategy worked. It worked, right? The, the reality is, you know, one of the most um, rewarding moments from my tenure with the administration was being able to share with the president and vice president the news in September 2021 that the racial gaps in vaccination had closed. And that was historic. Um, and there's so much that I hope that we keep from what we've learned in COVID-19 as we think about other health disparities and health inequities. But we have to be committed to doing more of the same, right? It's, it's great to see people fully vaccinated. We have to make sure people stay up to date. You're 100% correct. But the emergence of variants and others, I mean, the pandemic is still here. We now have to live with SARS-CoV-2. Um, but we shouldn't drop the ball, right? And so I know that people have done a lot of work. I'm gonna ask a personal favor to keep doing it, right? Turn to your neighbor, <laughs> encourage them to get vaccinated and stay up to date. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments on the COVID-19 vaccination. I wanted to say that Livingstone College was actually um, an institution that part, uh, we participated in the Interfaith America COVID-19 vaccination initiative. And the one thing, um, as we began to engage in work, particularly in our communities, I want to say that um, it was surprising to me that although it was a, a cause that everyone was coming together for, it, it, it became apparent to me that we were a nation that was also like divided. It became almost like the vaccinated versus the unvaccinated. But then even there were like subgroups and pockets. One of the things, uh, and subgroups and pockets, particularly as it relates to race, and you're talking about these historically marginalized communities. One thing that we, um, the African American community of uh, Livingstone College, in fact, our SGA president is, was Livingstone ambassador, Mr. <laughs> Kelly. Uh, but one thing that we realized was, for instance, when we had to convince a uh, pop uh, population to get the vaccination, the one thing that we did, we went back historically. We said, hey, the concept of inoculation is something that an African population brought to the United States with only missing cotton napper. And so when we did this, they were like, oh. And then you see this entire bill of sale of slaves, 250 Africans, who are what? Immune to the smallpox. So you, you saw this, um, this, this, pride a little bit in, the, <laughs> in this moment in history, but it was still uh, a moment of division in essence. It was like, well, you make sure your groups are vaccinated and we make sure our groups are vaccinated. So I just kind of want to know, is there some kind of uh, post work that the White House is actually doing as it relates to that? Like, sure, people came together, um, there's lots of places for the, for the vaccine, but still there were ways in which we seem to just find efforts to divide ourselves. When can I vote for you? <laughs> when are you running? Um, 
you know, I absolutely, uh, so, um, so I love that you share that story about, you know, kind of what it looks like to talk to communities that have been harmed um, by, uh, by large institutions, right, like healthcare and government, and to, um, to bridge, right, and address those concerns, and, uh, and, and trying to lift up a source of pride uh, in inoculation. I mean, I often talk about, uh, you know, us denying ourselves access to scientific discovery, right? And what does that mean when there are tools and resources available and we opt out of them, right, for a better man and our, and our health? Um, so I think that's right. But I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I can't see everyone, but I imagine there were lots of nods. As you said, our country is extraordinarily divided. Um, and we are. And I think, you know, we, the vaccination campaign did make us divided. Right? It just, like COVID-19 itself, it just revealed a lot of our fracture lines, right? And where the challenges are. Um, there is so much healing that needs to happen. Uh, and so, you know, directly to your question, this is, uh, this is a paramount importance uh, in, in the White House, across the administration. The president and vice president, you know, deeply believe in this. If you look at our national strategy to combat COVID-19, you know, when, when uh, President Biden, Vice President Harris were um, were elected. There, there wasn't a national strategy for COVID-19, so that was a lot of the work of the transition. And number one, the number one goal was to rebuild trust, uh, and so that has been very much a north star in the administration. So whether it's in the White House or across the agencies, you know, CDC and HHS um, in particular, when it comes to health, this is ongoing work, right? And I tell everybody. If you're gonna talk about health equity, if we're gonna talk about bridging this divide, it's, it's not a sprint, right? It's not a sprint. Um, that's why I also wanna bring always to people a, a message of rest and restoration and resilience, right? I need all of you to be well and be whole selves because it is a long journey. It's a long journey. But I think you have centered us in the right way. It's so deeply relational um, and when we can't uh, be able to relate to one another, then we're not going to make the strides we need to, whether it's public health or the economy or educational opportunity or others. Um, but I'm happy offline to connect you with any of the resources out of the administration now that are, that are working to heal that. And maybe just one other thing I would say, I had the honor of chairing um, for the president the COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force, which was an ex extraordinary experience for me. Um, Personally and professionally, I was able to work with just amazing folks from across the country on the task force, amazing federal agency leaders, um, amazing federal support team. You know, if I had to, to estimate, I would say we probably spent a third of our time talking about exactly this issue. Right? The president charged us to eliminate disparities in COVID-19, but also to plan for the future. And when we got into that planning for the future conversation, that's where we covered, right? Um, I'll make a plug for the work of the group, though. The, the task force did submit to the president uh, a list of recommendations. There are 55 prioritized, um, several hundred in total. Uh, and all of that is publicly facing, right? So the, the task force report, um, with all credit to the executive director of the task force, Dr. Okafor, um, she said, we're not going to just give recommendations. We're going to give an implementation plan. We're going to give an accountability framework. And so all those documents are available to anyone, right, who's thinking we deliberately um, worked on it, not thinking of just the federal administration of the audience, but really everybody who's sort of in coalition for health equity to be a tool and a, an asset. So I encourage you um, uh, to take a look at that, um, at that work. When we submitted it to, the, um, to POTUS and the president, I said, we get extra credit. You ask for recommendations and we give you an accountability plan, we give you an implementation framework, um, uh, and so hopefully that's one of the tools in the toolbox uh, moving forward. Good morning, Dr. Smith. Good morning. My name is Cam Miller. And can you describe health equity to college students? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. It's a great question. Um, and I'm going to even say a little bit uh, uh, to me. I think the you know when I was a a, a college student, I won't say what year I went to school, but um, when I was a college student, the term didn't even exist. Right when I went to medical school, 
the term didn't exist. We were talking a lot about, um, or starting to, I think, come into an awareness of health disparities, and I'm always very aware of the many scholars who, um, you know, who have come before, who have championed for intervention in health disparities, championed for health equity, have often been marginalized and diminished uh, in their own right, spheres because of because of that. And so, um, but but now, you know, I. I think we're right to all coalesce around uh, a reframe, right? We, we know what disparities are. We know disparities are differences. If we're talking about health and healthcare, those are differences between um, uh, uh, socially identified groups, really, that can't be explained um, uh, by anything like biology, right? So this is a, these are social definitions. If we talk about race, of course, we're talking about um, a social construction uh, Largely, and so um, for many years, we've we've all we need to continue to have our report cards around disparities. So when we see those differences, whether it's in uh, things like mortality, and you know, or it's things like treatment in healthcare. You know, patients come into the hospital with the same diagnosis, but yet they're treated differently. Right? That's time for us to interrogate ourselves as healthcare providers. Why is that? Um, and so we continue to do that work of intervening the health disparities, but health equity takes it to another level. And so we have to agree that everyone in the country, dare I say the world, right, should be able to attain, have the opportunity to attain that highest degree of health and well-being that's possible. Right? And what's standing in the way? Right? That's when we get back to that 60 to 80% of economic educational opportunity barriers and facilitators. Right? We have to talk about things like discrimination and bias and racism, things like access to nutrition, access to housing. That's all part of our health equity conversation. So, you know, we in the field we often talk about whether health equity is um, is a goal, right, or it's the journey itself. And you know, I'm a I'm a general attorney, so I'm going to say yes, right, and. So we have to every day with intention work towards health equity, right? How do we know when we've gotten there? We're not gonna see these disparities that can't be explained by anything other than social condition anymore. So it's really important. I'm grateful to all the, the organizations, the scholars, the many here, right, who have contributed to make this evidence base so strong. You know, working in this COVID-19 space, um, we know what to do, right? We know what to do. We just have to have the political will to do it, to achieve health equity. Great. I'd like to give a follow-up to that um, in your work and experience at the Yale School of Medicine. What would you say uh, was the transition in, with those new med students in terms of addressing uh, disparities that exist in, in the healthcare system? How has the curriculum evolved to address those issues? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I, I'm, I'm a very optimistic person, and I'm optimistic primarily because of the next generation. And so that is where I get my confidence, my inspiration, my assurances um, that we're going to be OK. Right? And the med students at Yale are the same. You know, the students are extraordinary, right? And our students came in and demanded curricular change. Right? Uh, as I think has happened in many medical schools across the country. Um, and we have an administration that, uh, that has responded. I had the opportunity to chair a curriculum review process for the curriculum at the School of Medicine. Um, and uh, you know, we issued um, our recommendations uh, there, and the recommendations have, have largely been adopted. I mean, we have a health equity thread now that cuts across all four years of our undergraduate curriculum. We have opportunities for advanced, deeper learning. One of the things we would observe in our med school class is some students would come in really kind of um, you know, ready for like health equity 101. And other students would come in already with like national footprints as leaders in the area. And so making sure uh, that there were tracks for all of our students. One thing I would say is, you know, I added a section two in our recommendations. We talked a lot about specific, specific curricular enhancements that have been implemented, but I also talked about institutional climate, uh, which I think is incredibly important. Um, because we could have some students come in who would say this isn't important, right? We don't need to learn this. We don't need to study this. 
Uh, and so we had to make sure that as an institution, we were walking, you know, walking the walk, not just talking the talk, and, and have conversations about things like, what's our faculty? What's representation on our faculty? How do we signal value? What do we invest in um, here in our research programs? What do we think is paramount? And so I'm really excited because we've done a lot of great work there, there too. But I'm looking out, I know, I'm hoping at, a, at several future medical students, hopefully future medical students of mine um, <laughs> at Yale. And I want to just encourage you to keep pushing us, right, anyone in leadership, to be better and do better. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, my name is Sheena Watson, and I'm the nurse here, director of the Student Health Center. I don't have a question in particular. Uh, but I do have a comment, and I thank you for coming. I want to redirect back to the COVID uh, issue. Mm -hmm. And oh, I would like for you to elaborate a little bit more for our young adult populations that are here on this campus uh, with the COVID issue. Um, we have a lot of young adults that contract COVID and they're asymptomatic. And when I try to explain to them, even though you're asymptomatic, uh, and then, you know, they occupy, and I don't think I have this, and blah, 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 this, and they don't understand the requirements of the isolation, and I'm trying to get them to understand that it's not just about them at this point because they're healthy, but it's about the community. And like you said, the social economic status of Rowan County yes. uh, is not the best, so I'm trying to get them to understand that you're not only looking up for yourself, but the community on this campus of our staff and our faculty, and even outside of Livingstone College, when you go shopping, uh, you know, you go up to the mall or something, the importance of following those guidelines. So I'm thinking maybe they hear it from you too. I was <laughs> going to say, I don't think I can say it anybody. You need to listen to her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try to, to champion these, uh, our students because they are very important on our campus. And our uh, younger students look up to them. So, you know, Yes. They're not the ones that I'm usually talking to, but if they understand and know, they can champion that yes. too and encourage the rest of the students. Uh, a thousand percent, right. I mean, if, if, there's, if, if there's ever been a time where we understand that, um, you know, we're not, we're not gonna, we're not gonna be okay, right, unless everybody's okay. Exactly. Right, and so I, I think it is um, just critical, everything you said. I mean, this is the testing piece, the, uh, following the, the, the guidelines set forth um, from CDC and the local health department regarding uh, you know, isolation, like all of that is critically important. You know, even when we would talk about the, the vaccine and vaccination, you could get that sometimes, right? Some of the, the younger folks might say, you know, the outcomes don't look that bad for my age population, right? We don't end up in the hospital as often. Um, you know, the, 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 thankfully, the numbers of, of lives lost, right, in the, in the younger age groups, much lower, right? And so why, right? Why should I get vaccinated? And it's because you live in community, right? Um, and that is a gift we get as humans, to live in community. And we have obligations and responsibilities because of that, all right? And whether that is vaccine and vaccination or testing and then following those guidelines, right? I behoove you. There are loved ones, right? And, you know, whether we take it as far as the stranger and, and um, you know, we make a lot of decisions in our family to, to protect people we don't know. And I want to encourage everyone to do that as well. Uh, but protect people you do know, right? Look around the room and think, we never know, right? You don't know who is, who is at risk for severe outcomes due to infection with SARS-CoV-2. And if you can, in, to me, the relative small sacrifice, right, to, to, to try to keep others safe is so very worth it. And in fact, you know, you owe it, right? You owe it to, to the community. Um, but I can't say it better than you did. <laughs> so I thank you. Right, and I thank you for all the work you're doing because this is it, right? Mm -hmm. Every day, this is what I mean, we cannot tire, right? We cannot tire. This is the work every day to speak to one person, right? And I know on those longest days, when I was going door to door in New Haven, right, knocking on people's doors and saying, do you have questions about the COVID-19 vaccine? Right, I'm a doctor, I'm here, can I help answer those questions? And you know, if we went home and had, you know, one person say, oh yeah, I've been meaning to, let me get an appointment, which is that made sense. You know, that's a win. And remember, like the nine times I always held that, I was like nine times for, for smoking, right? And there's so much going on in people's lives right now. 
So we're going to come back next week. We're not going to do it again. Okay. We're going to talk to you again about this. So thank you for all your work. Thank you so much for joining us yes. and being here and giving us your uh, time. Millions of Americans do not have health care. Yes. Um, America, excuse me, is one of the few countries <clears throat> excuse me, in the world that does few Western countries. In fact, actually, I would say one of the few countries in the world, and we don't offer universal health care. What is the Biden administration's position on universal health care? <coughs> and what is Yale's position on universal health care? Uh, so many countries around the world, countries that are very, don't have the resources that we have, and they give universal health care. And unfortunately, our health care is mostly private, and therefore millions of So I can't speak to the Biden administration policy or, or the, the Yale policy. I can certainly talk about um, you know, my, my, my take on this. And your observation is correct. When you look at, at peer nations, um, we are a standout. I mean, it's a much longer conversation than now for kind of how we are here and what our healthcare landscape looks like and healthcare financing. This is, a, I teach a class at our School of Management. We go very deeply into this topic. Um, so it is a paramount question of, of, of our time and of, uh, of the moment. You know, one of the things that I'm thinking about now and that the Biden-Harris administration was very, um, uh, in, in my opinion, was right on about was making sure that, if, especially during the pandemic, you know, people could have access uh, to Medicaid and not have to, to worry about losing their coverage through Medicaid. Um, as people will have noted, the, um, the, the sort of the, the, the national uh, emergency declaration of the pandemic will sunset in May. Uh, and what I would encourage all of us to do is think about how we can be helpful in that transition for folks who are on Medicaid, uh, which is one of the ways in our, in, our, in our country that we deal with issues of people being um, uninsured and underinsured is through the Medicaid program, which is a state and federal uh, collaboration for financing. And so as people have to um, reattest and sort of <coughs> demonstrate their eligibility for Medicaid, I think it's a moment when we might see folks fall through the cracks. Right? And so working within our systems as we have them, I would say this is a moment to really lean in. And whether that is volunteering with a community-based organization to help people get through that process, um, or reminding people, right, who you know are on Medicaid, and the, the, this, the, the, uh, the Medicaid social, uh, social safety net um, has grown, certainly in this administration. So to make sure that people continue to have access. And this is, and this is an extraordinary, um, not just political question, but I think social will question as well. You know, in my moments talking with politicians and doing briefings on Congress for COVID-19, um, there were many politicians who would say things like, we need to broaden access, um, we need to make sure people are insured, but that's not something that I could say outside of this room. And that's really stayed with me, um, because this notion of our, you know, certainly our elected officials trying to read the room, right, trying to say, what do my constituents want me to do? And that always is going to be the way that they lean. And so I spend a lot of time thinking with students and others about, you know, how do we um, create a, a social campaign that helps under, helps politicians um, see that there is, in fact, constituent support for thinking in new ways and expanded ways about bringing everybody into opportunities for, for health care. Um, so I feel like I'm giving the group a lot of work today, but I <laughs> don't intend to do that. Um, but, but I think that's really important too, is, is understanding uh, where elected officials, you know, it's, it's politics and policy, and knowing our power just as individuals who vote in this country, you know, make your positions known to elected officials and bring friends. 
Dr. Parrish actually spoke on something that kind of stuck out to me. It's when she brought up the political uh, issue. One thing I realized back in 2020, it was a thing where it was like, based on your political party, that's where you decided if you were gonna become vaccinated or not. And so I thought that was a major issue, but I was actually speaking to my grandmother who was not vaccinated one time, and she mentioned something about trauma. She was saying back then when she was growing up, it was a thing where they used to test on African-Americans. So it made African-Americans -Ameri African hesitant to get vaccinations such as that. And so she wasn't even uh, considering getting the vaccine because the fact that um, until, no, it was until she actually started, it started affecting her mental because she was self-isolating for so long for months. So I went months without seeing her because she was so big on not getting the vaccine, but she was also big on making sure she stayed healthy. And so how do we leave that stigma of trauma where we bridge the gap of trusting the healthcare community once again, and also leaving politics and healthcare out of the same uh, question? Because I don't believe it's the same thing, yeah. in my opinion. Right. No, thank you. Yeah, and thank you for, sh for sharing that really personal story about grandmother, it's something we heard over and over again, right? And so that's so why I think it's so important. Whenever you're gonna have a conversation about health equity or health disparities, that one of the first things we have to do is just own that trauma, own that historic, um, and I'll take the temporary, right, limited trustworthiness. We have to do that. We have to, 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 to validate, because it's true, right, where people's experiences have been and the harm that people have experienced um, uh, in the name of science. Particular, so um, so I think that is is point one. You know, point two, I'm really grateful you brought up mental health. Um, this is an area of great uh, focus, right? The the Office of Surgeon General and others really focusing on on you know what I refer to as our kind of mental health tsunami. You know, we have limited workforce. We still have a high degree of stigma around talking about mental health um, and mental wellness. And, um, you know, and there are, you know, whether it's uh, the, the stress of social isolation, uh, grief, which is very heavy and not um, equally distributed, right, across groups, um, the number of children who have lost not just one, but both caregivers in this. So <coughs> substantial resources and investments have to be put into mental health and addressing that. Um, and then the third around uh, taking politics out of healthcare, I smile because I'm gonna pass that baton to y'all <laughs> um, to figure out exactly how we do that. But you are right in that at various periods in the pandemic, kind of you know the the voting patterns of your district were the most predictive um, indicator of vaccination status, which was you know which should make all of us just scratch our heads a little bit, um, but understand just how big the boulder is and how steep. The, you know, the hill is that we have to do, but it doesn't mean we can't do it. Uh, and so, you know, depending on the day, you know, I'll, I, I, you know, I might lean more towards we can on politics and health care. Um, and other days it's sort of, well, the politics are here. So how do we kind of talk about this? And, you know, and, and thinking in the White House, you know, a lot of, of, of my work was thinking about, um, uh, you know, uh, racial, ethnic, uh, minority populations, also rural populations. So I often say in our country, you know, race and place. So those are stronger determinants of our health than our, than our you know, genetic code, right? So if you think about your zip code, where you live, and your social identity, I can tell you a lot more than if you gave me your DNA sequence, right, about what your health is like in this country. Um, and so with that reality, I think we have to look for a lot more place-based solutions. We have to think a lot more about all the trusted messengers that come under the tent. Uh, and um, and just have a really nuanced, I think, approach of, of dealing with this. So, but I'm looking at, I see all these white coats and all these students, and I'm gonna take a vacation because everybody here is gonna work on that. But you raise a whole host of really good questions. health and wellness here on campus, but I'm also a um, three-time and current breast cancer survivor. And so um, this was my first year ever 
being front facing with it, right? Um, it was very personal and I was very quiet about it. And the only reason why that I even talk, brought it up at all um, here on campus or you know, um, as an instructor here was because um, I couldn't get vaccinated because of I was in, I'm in treatment currently, right? And so um, I had to then tell our HR and everybody here that I couldn't get vaccinated and you know I had to go work online, which was great for a lot of reasons, <laughs> but um, I had personally um, and just professionally too dealt with the disparities, um, the ethnic disparities that comes with being, I'm having something as scary and big as the big C. Um, and so I can say too that um, this, this year I decided as well, I'm going to talk about it. Um, I'm going to talk about the disease. I'm going to talk about having it, especially as a black woman, right? Where we get everything, every disease first um, all the time. And then we also die the most from it. And so I just, knowledge is power. And there was, it was just, you know, hard for me to be working here with all of you and not Share, right, so um, I partnered, well, I'm actually on a couple of boards for the American Cancer Society, and I was so elated to find out that them and the American Heart Foundation changed their mission wow. in 2019, 2020, to include keywords like all and everyone, yeah. right, and they're talking about us, yeah. and so I was, I was so excited about that. Um, when I found that out, kind of sought out and it ended up on these boards. And, um, and he, he was actually here, Mr. Anderson, he's here somewhere. Um, he introduced me to, um, you know, one of the, the, a very powerful person here in Rowan County, her name is Joyce. And um, they had a gala that was all around equity disparity and closing the gaps. And so when you think about the American Cancer Society, you think, um, Oh, they're just doing funding for the cure. But no, 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 no. They have put in a lot of work. And um, as far as closing the gap, they do so much more than just that particular funding. I mean, everything in the rural co communities, um, taking you to, to, the, to the doctor, putting you up so that you can get to your treatments, um, all the financial resources that are out there for us. Um, I've been a person who didn't go to my appointment because I didn't have the copay. Or, and you're talking about cancer and you're not gonna go to your appointment because you can't pay? Or the first time you walk up to the, the, um, the window to sign in to do treatment, something you don't wanna do, and they say to you, can you put anything on your balance? And you wanna walk out, <laughs> right? So I've dealt with it and um, was very proud to know that they were doing something about it. Um, and with that being said too, um, we decided that we were going to partner here. They want to work with Living Stone as well. And, um, you know, kind of, ch I, I just was charged and championed to do a podcast. We have a great podcast we're supposed to do um, for the American Heart Cancer Society from Living Stone to get the word out, to keep us informed, and to give us the knowledge we need to be able to close these, you know, equity gaps in healthcare from, in, every, in all of them. Not just with COVID, but with cancer, with um, diabetes, with all of it. Um, and so, we're, you're, I'm gonna be on the mic. I've done two already, um, and be on the mic. And, you know, just with you know, just talking about what we're doing for the American Cancer Society to close the gaps for us as a people, um, as a community, um, as a country. Uh, so I'm super proud of that. And so I guess my question then for you. Is, if I um, get a question, can we just give you a round of applause? Yeah. <laughs> thank you for all you're doing. Oh, thanks. Thank um, for sharing your journey. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, I, my question is, with the you know the American um, Heart Foundation and the American Cancer Society changing their missions, um, how much have you all in, in to do with that, and I was, after sitting here and talking with you, and, and you know, last night and then today as well, 
Um, you know, I'm just really proud of that, and I'm, I'm proud of you. And I, you know, I, I couldn't help but think that, that with them changing their missions, when they change them because of all the work, that is because of the work that you're doing. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about that. Did my mom tell you that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, thank you, thank you. And um, it, it just, I mean, it's gonna take me a second to regain my thought, because anytime anybody says they're proud of me, I just like, well, because um, uh, we're all just trying to be in service. And so, uh, so thank you for that. Um, yeah, I will say that, so, you know, of course, I have many close colleagues and friends who are the leadership at ECS and American Art Association um, and others. And I will, you know, in health equity is we work, right? So it, always, it is always we work. And so it is, you know, I'm, I'm grateful to have been invited into conversation with these professional organizations as they think about what to do with their resources and their mission and other things. But it is leadership from within these organizations that is saying, you know, we are ready to take this in a different direction and meet this moment. Um, and you know, it's a it's a good moment, it's a good opportunity for me to say, particularly to the learners in the room, who is at the table matters so much, right? And if that's just if you only hear me say one thing today, right? It's that, like, who is at the table matters so much. And so when you think about leadership at these organizations, um, it, the leadership is really diversified and changed, right? And I think that there is, there is import to having a diversity of perspectives, right? To having diverse leaders. This is the work that all of you will do. There isn't just one path to being incredibly and deeply difference making, whether it's in health equity or it's in science, medicine, or any of the areas, right? There are many paths. In fact, you're gonna blaze your own path, right? When I was in medical school, there wasn't a role like senior advisor to the president on health equity that didn't exist, right? Um, but that was because of the leadership, you know, the president and the vice president to say this is really important, we're gonna create this. So I'm looking out at a number of people I know who are gonna have roles and jobs and responsibilities that don't even exist today, right? I met somebody who was the chief educational evangelist at Google. And what they said was, when they were getting their PhD, Google didn't exist, right, much less. So this is the world, right? And show up at those tables. Raise your hands, do the service on the committees. Right? Help bring a different perspective. Share your personal stories, right? To help persuade people to understand how urgent it is. Right, and how important it is for everybody. I think that's part of the conversation that you just raised too, the all and everyone. It's a big lesson from COVID-19. You know, health equity isn't my problem, right? It's not their problem, it's our problem, right? And so we have to be understanding together, whatever the argument. I mean, I, I, I used to be very um, insistent that people agree with me, right? Like what brought you to the table was the same thing that brought me to the table. And now like, I've aged out of that a little bit. <laughs> and now I'm like, I'm happy at the table. And maybe you're here because if we're all well, your company's gonna be more profitable. I don't mind that, that's good. You can sit at the table, right? Um, somebody else is here because like, you know, these are deep social justice issues that have to be addressed. Yes, come to the table. And so that's my hope for all of you, that you're gonna build some of these tables and you're gonna definitely be represented at these tables because there is so much, I mean, it is within grasp, I'm a parent, you know, my motivation every day, my three children, I really want them to live in a world where they're like, what, what did she do? Health disparity, what's a health disparity, right? Like, I want to work myself out of a job, and that's what I want you all to do too, right? Just make it so that the grandchildren are like, what was, what are these history books referring to? That's what we have to do. So as a follow-up and as we begin to close, I wanna talk about your work in the, uh, Eastern Caribbean Health Outcomes Research Network um, that uh, started um, studying about 3,000 residents over the age of 40, but now has added a pediatric portion. Um, and so can you talk briefly about that and the importance of doing that same kind of work with young people in those island territories? Yes, yes, thank you. Um, we're back to the territories question. You all gonna get this quiz before the time is done. So, um, so one of the, the projects, uh, so ECHORN, as we refer to it, the Eastern Caribbean Health Outcomes Research Network, and it is a, 
Um, it is a consortium of researchers, academic institutions, policy makers, faith leaders, community based leaders across um, the region. Um, so we have, it, it, the team itself is about 100 people strong, and then we have a, a broad network of partners and others, and it's been just a deep honor to, to be principal investigator on this NIH uh, work. Um, and it really began with, uh, with some work we did around quality of care in the U.S. territories, right, and highlighting some of those disparities um, that, that have been invisible, right? And this is a moment where I get to say the thing that I always say, which is uh, in COVID-19, here in Ecuador, when we think about chronic disease, you know, data invisibility is a form of violence. And when we think about disparities in particular, even in COVID-19, so many people could not see themselves in our data systems. And so even when it came down to something that seems now so, so obvious, you know, people with disability, kind of what is the burden in COVID-19? And there was no data set that kind of had, um, had collected the variables in a way, right, at all, or in a way that could allow us to answer some of these questions. So I really want to push you to, right, looking at all these white folks, that data may not always be the most exciting topic, but it's the one thing. Whenever people say you can get one thing, I say I want the data. And with the U.S. territories, that's where we began, right? What are the data for what health looks like um, in the territories? And we found that the outcomes were, were worse for people there, for heart attacks, for pneumonia, for heart failure. Um, and we really wanted to understand better, right, what to do to intervene and change. And then this is the important power of community connection and working with community and community partnership. Because in talking to people in regions, everyone said, yes, we have a lot of healthcare issues and questions, we want to address those. What we really need, though, is some basic surveillance. We have a lot of hurricanes here. We don't even know how many people are going to need dialysis when a hurricane comes through. Like, can you help us? And so we changed our whole orientation and our whole approach in Equin as we launched to be in service to leaders in the region, to provide real-time helpful data for policy setting and practice change. Um, and we began with adults, and we're really excited now with additional funding from NIH to be able to expand to the bio-related children of those adults and really think about this across the lifespan. And we're really excited. We have many, many projects going on um, uh, under the Exxon umbrella, um, including biomarker work <laughs> that we'll talk about more. And that we're really excited about. But we're always recruiting interns too. We have a lot of virtual interns on our team. So I'll make a little plug to it. I can never talk to a group of students without saying if anybody's interested in, in doing some internship work with us, that's one of our projects. I direct the Equity Research and Innovation Center. We have many projects that Eric and interns are involved with. Thank you. So uh, as we begin to wrap things up today, um, I want to thank everyone for coming. Um, and we're going to move out into the atrium area for reception and tour. Um, I want to thank Dr. Marcella Nunez-Smith for joining us today. Thank you. to encourage uh, Livingstone students to take advantage of that plug for internship yes. and research with Dr. Nunez Smith. So now um, I will ask Dr. Williams if he will come forward and bless the food for us and we will uh, move to the second part of our program.